My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Monday, May 7, 2012, and I'm in Kingfisher County, Oklahoma, on the A. a. Thomas Hill Farm, interviewing Carmelita Hempel and Twyla Williams. Thank you so much for joining us today. This project is part of our Oklahoma Centennial Farm Families Oral History Project. And we're going to begin today by learning how your family came to Oklahoma. Would you like to start us off, Carmelita? This story probably describes a lot of what happened in 1889, April 22nd. It was written by my great aunt Maddie, who was the daughter of John DeRise Hill and Mary Shaw. And she just tells her story and I'm gonna read it. My father, John D. Hill, came to the opening of Oklahoma on April 22nd, 1889. Brother Frank was sick at the time of the opening, so mother could not come for the run. Father first staked the farm east of his farm, but a man came up from the creek and claimed he had staked the farm first. So father went back west and traded a horse for the farm, which he kept for home. He filed on the farm and came back to Texas and sold the little calves, which he said would be too small to make the trip, and a few other things. He then put all our earthly possessions in the wagons and hitched two yoke of oxen to a wagon that was loaded high and then on behind this hitched a trail wagon loaded with an extension bed which was wide so we would have room to ride and sleep at night. Every night one bed was made on the ground. We brought five cows and they had to be milked. We would drink and use all the milk we could and throw the rest away. We brought five horses and two of us children rode to drive the cows. Three young horses were tied to the back of the trail wagon. He had a very small garden at first, then father dug a well, in which mother hung her butter so we would be, it would be nice to sell. He also made a dugout in which to keep the milk. The spring was nice, but when it rained, we couldn't get across the creek to get water. There was a real large cottonwood tree near the house, which made a wonderful shade for us. My father and brother Herbert, plowed and planted corn, kafir, and cane as fast as they could, and planted crookneck squash, sibley, and hubbard squash, and pumpkins. We raised lots of them, and when father built the sod house, we moved in and then gathered the pumpkins and squash. The dugout was full of them, and we sold some and fed some to the five cows, which mother milked. The grass was knee-high until it was pastured so much. Father freighted for the Fred, Fred Belt, a few times the first summer and took pay in groceries. The trips to Guthrie were long and hard. Father worked some and when they were building the railroad south of Kingfisher. Mother washed and helped the woman who was cooking for the men who worked on the railroad. The woman had three little girls and needed help. With the money which the folks received, we had a wonderful Christmas, which I never will forget. Father built a pole stable and stacked lots of feed on the north side, and prairie chickens came to eat the grain. When it snowed a lot, Father shot lots of them. We had them to eat and took to town and sold some. The next summer, Father built another sod house, and when he threshed, he put his wheat in the first sod house and had a large bin of potatoes and quite a bit of onions. He sold some in Kingfisher and took some to El Reno. The sod houses were cool in summer and warm in winter. The second summer we raised nearly three barrels of cucumbers and we pickled or brined. Mother freshed them out and made sweet pickles of them and sold them. I never heard people talk about the hard times then. I guess they didn't have time. Father hauled logs to sawmill, to the sawmill and the oak lumber was used in the first house we built. Lou Thorpe helped build that house. Father worked some at the stone quarry and got some stones for his house and some for the walks to the well. The house was the first house they owned. The, the basement area had was stone, I think. And some for the walks to the well. Our first granary had a stone foundation also. That was basically it. When we were coming to Oklahoma, I started to get out of the wagon one day about 1 p.m. to ride one of the ponies and help drive the cows. As I jumped from the tongue, my dress caught and I fell and the front wheel ran over my ankle. And we drove the rest of that day and all the next day until about 9 p.m. when we got to the doctor's office at Fort Reno. 
My ankle was awfully swollen, and the doctor and his, his two helpers worked four hours with my ankle. When it was finished, I had the thickest plaster Paris cast I ever saw to wear for five weeks. The joint was awful stiff, so I soaked my foot every day in warm water and rubbed it with angle warm oil, which we made by gathering lots of worms and heating them carefully until they were in oil. One of our ponies was bitten by a snake, and as soon as Father found her, he brought her to the well land and tried to give her water. Brought her to the well and tried to give her water, as it was hard for her to bend, bend her head down. Father put the tub in the wagon, and this horse stood there all the time with her jaw in the tub. Father emptied the tub often and put fresh water in it. He also put some feed in the wagon, and she could do as, as she wanted to do about eating. She lived several years and was a very nice horse. There was a small sore on her jaw where the snake had bitten her. Our first school was in a sod house. Miss Lula Hunt came down from Kansas and taught one month. She stayed with her sister, Mrs. Dunlap. Miss Hunt was only 16, and when the four weeks were up, she went home. She and her mother came to visit, visit us in 1891 when her brother Ed cut our wheat. We had Sunday school at the sod schoolhouse, and there was some preaching. A colored minister preached one sermon. The people liked his sermon very much, but I never saw him or his wife again. Mr. Preston was our first Sunday school superintendent and lived on the farm that cornered fathers on the Northeast. He sold his farm and moved near Passion. He came to see us once and stayed all night. We had a fine visit with him. He told us his days were numbered and he expected to go any time, so he wanted to get his business fixed for his family. He went to Kingfisher just 19 days after that, and he reached to shake hands with one of his friends, and that was the last movie made, and he was gone. <laughs> hmm. That's the woman's perspective of being raised on this farm in early 1889 and early 1900s. And they made the run from... I have another story that tells where they made the run from. Let's see. Yes, this one tells that, and it was written by my grandfather. You want to hear that one too? Let's hear it. Okay. My father, and this is written by my grandfather, Herbert C. Hill. It was in the Kingfisher Free Press, 75th anniversary edition. My father, John D. Hill, this is a brother to Maddie, was born in Michigan, his parents having come from New York. My mother's parents, who met, whose name was Shaw, had come from Canada to Michigan. I was born in Michigan on November 17, 1879. Maddie, Lemuel, and Robert were also born in Michigan. Father moved the family from Michigan to Meade County, Kansas. Jenny and Frank were born during the four years we lived in Kansas. Then we moved to Texas, where we lived until April 1889. At noon on April 22, 1889, Father started in the race for land from a point just southwest of Kingfisher. He first staked the southeast quarter on Uncle John's Creek, four miles south of Kingfisher. After staking this quarter, a sooner came up out of the creek and said he was there first. The sooner gave Father a horse for that quarter. After that, Father staked the adjacent southwest quarter, which he owned until his death. The family came from Texas in covered wagons pulled by two yoke of oxen. Lemuel and I rode horses and drove the cattle. The cows gave plenty of milk for our food on the trip. The Indians wanted to trade for the little blue-eyed boy, Lemuel. The first summer we lived in a covered wagon under a large cottonwood tree. A brush arbor was built for a living room and a cave was dug in the bank in which the butter and cheese were stored. In the fall, we built a sod house, which was warm for the winter and cool during the next summer. The next year, the sod house was enlarged and used for the following four years. Additional ch children born during this time were Etta, Alva, Jim, and Floyd. The first year, we plowed with oxen and planted feed and garden. Some feed and butter were sold. In Kingfisher, we sold squash and potatoes. We had antelope, deer, quail, prairie chickens, cottontail rabbits, and jackrabbits for food. On the creeks, there were raccoon, mink, beaver, and possum. Several rattlesnakes were killed the first few years. Later, we hauled lumber from Uncle John's Creek and from Campbell Creek to fill, build the first frame house on the farm. There were four rooms downstairs and one room upstairs. A good well was dug near the house. This well was used to supply water for horses and thresher crews. 
and also this house was built in 1892 and the well was dug in 1892. Then they later built a barn in 1910, which is still here on the farm. First, I, this is my grandfather, first I attended a school in Kansas and later one in Texas. After moving to Kingfisher County, I went to school with my younger brothers and sisters in a sod house. I attended Kingfisher College. Several, several of the children went to Kingfisher High School, some to Edmond Teachers College and others to Hills Business College. Okay. Okay. The next part tells about him going out west to Ellis County to do a, another land so, run and stake a claim. Just so I have the generations correct. Your mm -hmm. father and mother were? A. Thomas Hill and Thelma Hill. And then your grandparents? Were Herbert C. Hill and Lily Day Hill. And then your great grandparents? Are John Darius Hill and Mary Shaw Hill. And that they made the run? And... Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, good. So when they moved here, you know, you have to live on the land for so long. Mm. Uh, did they build a dugout? They did. They called it a sod house in here, but I know at first it was just a dugout. It does talk that, about it. It did talk about it. It said there was a brush harbor until, and then they had a dugout for the, the milk and vegetables. And then it said then they, before winter came, they moved, they enlarged the dugout so the family could live in there. And what would happen over time to the dugout? Right, like if you looked mm -hmm. for it now, sure. it would be eroded. I tried to find that spot, and the only way I can find that spot now, because I came back after having not looked for 30 years, and the creek has changed, the little stream has changed its mm -hmm. course. The cottonwood tree, there's no sign of it that they parked their wagon under, and that was wonderful shade they talk about in the stories. For we know wagon. the general area. We know we can, show we can tell by a post, because <laughs> there was a fence, and the corner post was where my dad showed me that they Oh, had the dugout okay. and camped on and I remember the cottonwood tree had been struck by lightning when I was a child but okay. I can't find all of that stuff now I can just find the corner post but we can show you that so tell me about some of the early structures on the property well as I told you in those stories it was a sod house right and uh, the dugout before that the first to put the cold things in to keep cold and uh, then they dug another well down closer to the area they first settled in. And then in 1892, they dug the well where we knew as the windmill, which you can still see here. And that's where they also built a home that I described was described in that story. And uh, the family lived in that. And when we came here and we were children here, you could still see some of the furnishings they had like a horsehair sofa that was back on a back wall and some of the things that a creamer and just different things they hadn't used were in that house still when we came. How big was the home? Uh, four yeah. rooms downstairs, one up, not, mm -hmm. not large. And maybe a basement or a little bit of a basement. And, a and it was, basement. the well was dug real close within 10 steps of this house. Mm -hmm. And they lived in that house until 1914 or 15 when they built the home that was here that burned in 04. Well, tell me about that home. Okay, that home was a 1914 Montgomery Ward, let me see how they see it. Fab type? Uh, mail order mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lumber and nails were shipped by rail it was two-story, it was a square. Every room was square, I think, and they were kind of on top of each other. Four rooms upstairs for bedrooms with a little hall at the top of the stairs and a closet, and four rooms downstairs, living room, dining room, separated by double doors of dark mahogany type wood. And an enclosed and, stairway that and uh, emptied kitchen, into the kitchen. Kitchen and bedroom on the south side of the house, and as you came around from the kitchen to the bedroom, there was a enclosed stairwell up to the upstairs. It had a door at the bottom. And that's where we had our old tiny telephone, you know, that you, but oh. they didn't have that at first. <laughs> I couldn't bring that, that's on my wall. She actually has that decorating her house. And then on the back porch, it was, and I don't know, I think it was enclosed even early on, mm -hmm. but definitely when we were there and we had a wash tub and the old fashioned ringer thing going with a rinse tub on that porch and then later a freezer at the other. It was fairly roomy. 
And on the south end of that was when my grandmother lived here and my great grandmother, a pantry and maybe a washroom or something. We, we made a bathroom on that south end with a sink, toilet and bathtub in it. And uh, they didn't have that until we moved here in 1950. And uh, the kitchen was large, had sunny south windows and kind of the hub of the home, I think, always. And uh, when we moved here in 1950, they were using wood stoves, wood heat for heat and wood for cooking. Mm -hmm. And we actually had a coal pile of coal out there that sometimes they used when we were, I was really young. But when we actually moved into the house, my dad bought this farm from the estate in 1942. And I've got somewhere the price, but I didn't bring it with me. It wasn't much. But he brought it, bought it from the estate. His father lived here at that time with his family. Mm -hmm. And they had moved back here in 1934 because Grandpa John Darius Hill was alone. His wife had passed away. He was needing help. He was getting elderly and senile and needed help. Mm -hmm. And they came to come take care of him. And at that time, the two oldest children, oh, two three oldest children of Herbert C. Hill, which is my father, A. Thomas Hill. He was in college at LSU, and his brother Ernest was in college at LSU, and Ruby, their sister, had married and stayed out in western Oklahoma. But those other children were raised here. My dad's brothers and sisters, there were seven left that were raised here and went to school here, and they went to a little school. I think my uncle called it Victory School. I've got notes on that somewhere, and they left them down. Victory School, which was less than a mile east of here. And uh, two of the boys I know were in 4-H Club, maybe three. Uh, maybe a girl was even in 4-H Club. And uh, my uncle told me about that recently. I have one, I have two uncles still living that can tell me a little bit of history of this farm. But um, when they moved here in 1934, it was depression years. So mm -hmm. they used the wood stove for heat and wood stove for cooking and the other children didn't want to come back to the farm well they were already grown okay at osu uh, they came back to visit i'm sure but they were grown they didn't want to work the land or uh, well my dad really had a dream since he was a little boy mm -hmm. since his grandfather lived here he came back when he was three or four and has an early memory of coming back on a train to this place and was so excited to see it and see he loved the farm. land our daddy he loved always the land. loved the land and he dreamed from the time he made two or three more trips back, he wanted to live here and farm this land. So he was so waiting for an opportunity. He worked his way through the Depression uh, on ranches out in western Oklahoma in Roger Mills County mm -hmm. and put himself through high school and then worked his way through college at OSU. And I've got stories about that, may not apply to this history, but really had to work his way in the barns and in the different areas there to get to be a student there and graduated there. I think he went there maybe around 1932. I've got one graduated somewhere. But he has got his first degree in vocational agriculture and has been taught vocational agriculture, but he also got a master's degree in agronomy. Long, no, it was, I've got that down somewhere too. It was an economist, um, kind of had to do with upstream watershed. Well, anyway, he ended up working in that field. Mm -hmm. And he studied agronomy. He did study agronomy. At the time that our daddy was in college at Oklahoma a and his family was really struggling here to on the them. farm. To feed, to feed the family, to, to clothe them. And one of the girls said, they tell a story about one of the girls, and she said, Mama's going to have another baby, and we don't have enough shoes for the ones we have. So there were, there was definitely uh, very uh, much of a struggle. To and even A. Thomas Hill and Ernest, his brother, in school at she would send some money home mm -hmm. for like glasses for their mother mm -hmm. or something like that. To try to help they had. And the, the children being raised here, the youngest one was only about four or five and then went up to about high school age when they moved here. Mm -hmm. But they, as soon as they got high school age, they worked off the farm to support mm -hmm. themselves. They and they didn't have home. school buses to transport the children to high school. To Kingshire High School. So, so they stayed in town yeah. with an uncle mm -hmm. and lived in his basement or worked for someone and stayed in town to go to high school. And they worked for 
their sister, older sister who got married and they lived on a farm east of here and the boys would go work and help over there and the girls would go help with those children, you know. So our daddy, A. Thomas, is the one that started college. He was the oldest of 10 children and several of the other brothers and sisters followed to get the college degrees. And he against encouraged our them. Odds. He encouraged them a whole lot and tried to help them. But Herbert C., their daddy, he valued an education and when some of the... Uh, men were probably keeping their children home for harvest. I think he sent his to school. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's why they were able to complete high school and go to college. Well, tell me about the, the early crops being grown. Well, I got, I asked my Uncle John that question because he grew up here and uh -huh. had heard that. Let's see if I can find that. And he was a VOAC teacher. And, he ended up and, being a VOAC uh, teacher. So a lot of them majored in, in vocational agriculture or something related to that. Um, I know they raised oats and wheat. And that, that this early, early uh, story relates that they did sh sugar cane. Or some kind of it's cane. Some kind of cane. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know if it's sugar cane. I had that somewhere in that story mm -hmm. too. But they, uh, and they did, Michael John told me, have more acres in wheat and in crops in that they got to where they had about a hundred and let's see if I can find that note. They ended up having a lot in crops and then when my dad bought the farm he gradually put native grass back in some areas and has more pasture. It probably had to do with he was he was a product of the Depression Dust Bowl days and was in concert studying mm -hmm. conservation. At OSU, sorry. So the uh, farm has a lot of natural grasses on it that were planted mm -hmm. by my dad. And the man renting it now would like to plow up some of that, and I'm real hesitant mm -hmm. to put more in wheat because I know dad had a reason for having those pastures there. And sometimes you can make your living from cattle when you camp them. Right. When the wheat gets hailed out or drought takes it or something. Um, I have the crops written down here. I can't find my notes on. I know they raised alfalfa when we were children, and the generation before them raised alfalfa, and I don't know when that started. Mm -hmm. But I think there were a, somewhere I've got how many acres were in crops at one point. But this this particular land seems to have yet, um, been best suited for wheat. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what you'll see in this area more than anything else. And my mother was raised in eastern Oklahoma. When she came here, she was amazed that you could just plant your seed and leave it in the ground. And it, you didn't have to hoe in between or pull anything, you know. It just kind of took care of itself until it was time for harvest. Of course, there's still a lot of things that can happen to the crops before they get harvested. But Where would you take the crops to market? Well... When we were children, I think our generation before us, there were elevators in town that you took them to. Kingfisher. And then, Kingfisher and King Co-op Elevator. Kingfisher Co-op Elevator, and then they were freighted to wherever mm -hmm. they went to the next step in the process. And I don't know about when my grandfather was here. I'm sure it was a railroad you know, car that carried the grain. Mm -hmm. And I know there were threshing crews and threshers before there were combines. Because even when I read something in here about the well that they dug, that was the one we were raised with too, that they went to a certain depth so the water would be a softness or something for the threshing of the wheat, mm -hmm. which I don't understand much about that. But um, your, your father's mother, did she have a job off the farm or did she? She didn't at first. She quit working. She was a teacher before we were born. No, she's like talking she about, oh, no, our I'm father's Thomas mother. Hill's wife, mm -hmm. Thelma Hill. Now, you were I talking was... about the grandmother, weren't you? Right. Our grandfather's mother. No, she, oh, she was no. old. She, she, was, was she had 10 children. Okay, so she was full-time. Um, full-time. <laughs> <Very. Okay. laughs> and mostly taking care of the kids in the house. Okay. She did carry, I'm sure, water from a well, too, sometimes. but And then your grandmother was a teacher. 
my mother was right. a teacher. Your mother. Yeah. And she didn't teach when after we were born until I was in the fourth grade. Okay. But the farm, from 1950 to for seven years, there was drought. Mm -hmm. Every crop my dad planted, the cotton crop, failed. they even tried cotton. And it failed. The wheat crops were not very good. And that was the last year to try cotton. Yeah. I'm stuck with wheat yeah. and cotton yeah. wasn't mm -hmm. fun and didn't work. But uh, it was hard to make a living those years. And then when I was in fourth grade, I guess I figured I was old enough I could come home with a key and get in the house. She started teaching. My dad was still here, but he'd mm -hmm. be out working more on the farm. But um, we'd come home from school and mother would get home a couple hours later because she taught in Cashin at first. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when I was in the sixth grade, 12, 11, probably 11, um, my dad went to work for Soil Conservation Service and he had to travel all the time. He was, the home office I think was Claremore, but he worked in eastern Oklahoma County, McAllister, Oklahoma Chickasha, City, mm -hmm. El Rant, yeah, Chickasha, Claremore. He worked in all those places and he worked until he retired. Mm, he was probably 65 when he retired, so. So he was a part-time farmer. He was a part-time farmer, and it was very stressful. He would call home and ask what the weather was. Mother was always supposed to know what uh -huh. she was supposed to turn on the TV. And, and his vacations were harvest when he, he did his harvest. He took his vacation to harvest. We he, never traveled and took vacations as such. And on weekends, he would go home and get out there and do the work, you know, that had to be done. And, be tired at night and have to drive back to Claremore or McAllister or wherever he was working. Would he have outside help? He did hire help, but mm -hmm. not usually when he was gone. It was when he was home. He would hire and he help. would go to town to the courthouse where people would gather that were looking for employment. He also picked up people along, hitchhikers along the rail road, uh, highway. And they came and worked for him. Sometimes high school boys came and out and worked. And um, they, my mother fixed the more, the noon meal for them, and that was dinner. Mm -hmm. And they got the full meal deal. And if um, they were too busy to come in, their their meal would be taken to them in a bucket to the field. Mm -hmm. And so we were. He got the help where he wherever he could find it. It was temporary help. It wasn't full time help. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, one of the hired men was sleeping out under the trees on a cot, and the wind came up in such a gust of wind that it blew his cot over. Mm -hmm. That could have been Alabama Joe. He's the one from Alabama that we, we always remember. He actually got to sleep in a bed in the house after that, I think. <laughs> and uh, we, he would also come from El Reno on his way home from Chickasha, and he would stop and pick up, pick up hitchhikers near that prison, and my mother would say, don't pick up those hitchhikers. And he brought some out here to work on the farm. It's a wonder we're still here today. <laughs> we were never uh, worried about all that. About, we, we never had any encounters that were negative with any of the hard help that oh. came from here. Even though we took milk and sandwiches to the field and mm -hmm. we interacted with them, you know. Never any problems with them. They enjoyed talking to us and hmm. joking with us. But there were always hired men when my dad was working on the farm. Hmm. Except maybe in the winter when we could kind of handle it ourselves. Then it, we got old enough, we handled quite a bit too in the way of chores. <laughs> well, we're going to get to that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so it was your dream of your father's to to come back to this farm, mm -hmm. and and when he did, did he switch up the the crops at that time? Did he do anything? Like I said, he put in more pasture okay. over the years, and he. I've got written down somewhere how many acres went back into, you know, how many acres there were toward the end in wheat and how many there were at one time earlier on. Our daddy just had a passion for the land and the soil and the crops. And, um, and he took a pride of ownership and being a part of the legend that preceded him here. That was very important to him from, from all his life. Until he died, he was out here. When he was 95, he still lived here and and uh, was doing everything he could. Well, being a conservationist, did he terrace the land? Did he... he did, and he was so conservative with his money, and he had to be from the Depression years and a hard time making a living. He never bought the newer, bigger tractors. He had a little Ford 
gray Ford Ferguson tractor, and he plowed those terraces up and back with those. Where we built, rebuilt those terraces, he built in 1950, just this past 2011, with bulldozers. Mm -hmm. And that's he what he got it. the award for, that conservation. Mm -hmm. uh, so a conservation award that he got in the 1990s. Sometime. For building the terraces and for planting the grasses. Native grasses and doing some uh, crop, uh, they call it CRP now, but they called it soil bank at one time, I think. And he did a lot of terracing, but he did it just with that little Ford tractor going back. I remember just seeing him go back and mm -hmm. forth. And that took a lot of time to do that mm -hmm. way. Well, his... Uh, budgeting teacher was the depression <laughs> but also uh, growing up in a poor family and also uh, he learned a lot about economy when he was at uh, uh, Oklahoma A&M mm -hmm. and and our mother also knew a lot about budgeting because she grew up in the depression and also she had, was schooled at Oklahoma A&M and at and Home Economics. But uh, she also had a job where she went as a, a farm. It was uh, her job in the 1930s. She worked for Farm Security, a government loaning agency for farmers. And her job had been to teach the farmer's wife how to make what were called home plans to accompany the farm plans made by the farm supervisor. So her home plan here on this farm had a slim budget. But somehow, back then we didn't have so many requirements as we have now. So we were well fed and we were clothed and we didn't want for anything uh, really. Uh, I, it was stressful for our parents. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest challenge of being uh, living on the farm was just trying to make the dollar stretch. But I do remember one Christmas where our mother, and we always got one gift, and she said this year there is only one dollar for your Christmas gift. So we went to the catalog, Montgomery Ward catalog, and I picked out a storybook doll, and I was satisfied with that, and I don't know what she I got. I think I got a storybook doll, too. Mm -hmm. They were probably but one year I got a hairbrush. <laughs> <laughs> one year I got a scarf. I wrote that in my diary. But we can remember those things, and if we had gotten... 50 things, could we remember that now? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> what's a, what's a, a storybook doll? No, uh, well, that, but what's <laughs> a farm, the, the home plan, the, what budget. she did? The budget. Uh, it was a budget? Actually, I should have brought it. I've got some of them. Okay. It was a home farm record book. Okay. And you got those from probably your county agent. But this was the home plan she did back in the 30s. So if you were the farmer's wife and she came in here mm -hmm. and the man would go out with the farmer and make the budget mm -hmm. or be at the table and make the budget, then and you were the farmer's wife, she would come in and sit down with you and say, what are your necessities and mm -hmm. what is your source of income and this is how you can save money and this is and what part of your budget should be for this and that. Hmm. Interesting. And then a storybook doll, what's that? I think it was a, a rigid, probably about six inches tall. Mm -hmm. And uh, they fit inside a storybook looking thing. Okay. It opened like a book mm -hmm. and then it was just in there and they were just little cute dolls. I don't know if there was a story with them, but they were dressed, you know, and they were mm -hmm. small. Affordable. And I was something we got for Christmas that we remembered. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that were our age got story that all for Christmas sometime. Mm -hmm. And a few other things maybe, mm -hmm. but not depending on farming <laughs> <laughs> or income. Yeah. So when you moved here in the 50s, tell me outside of the, the home, what were some of the structures still left on the land? They were all here. Except that I don't remember ever seeing the dugout, but the barn, the old 1892 house, the windmill, they built some uh, hen houses like for laying hens on the west end of that home they built in 1892. They just extended it out and put a hen house kind of went out west 
from that. And a, a little garage was up there too. I remember my dad could pull his truck in it. Kind of and then the there was house. the um, the original frame house that by the time we moved here had been rocked. And then there was a garage closer to the house, but it was detached. It was a buggy garage. It was called it was a buggy garage. buggy garage, but we used it for our cars. Too. Very narrow and very mm -hmm. crude. And it was right outside this house. It was right, you know, within 10 steps of this house. And there was kind of a little shed that the sheep went in sometimes. So there were several little buildings, an old barnyard. Behind the buggy garage was another hen house <laughs> that I remember when I was little going out to get together eggs. And you could you ate the frying fryers and you saved the laying hens for laying eggs. And that was just out behind that little buggy garage. Well, yeah. our mother would go out and chase down a hen and she would wring its neck. She would step on its neck. She would pull its head off. She would dip it in boiling water, and then we would sit we outside would and pluck the feathers. And then we had fresh chicken for supper. <laughs> it was very good. <laughs> See, I always ask, you know, was there always a technique? Everybody has a different technique mm -hmm. with the chicken. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, where did you move from? We moved, I, let's see, my parents first lived in Covington, Oklahoma, and he taught Boag there for five or six years. I saw that. It was quite, quite longer than I oh. thought. Then they moved from there to Dover, which is between here and Kingfisher and Enid. Mm -hmm. And I was... You were born there. Born there and lived there till I was two. She wasn't born yet. Then we moved to Moore. He taught Boag at Dover and then at Moore mm -hmm. High School. And we just lived within a walk or like a block of the high school. And I was born and right there. right next to the railroad track. She was born there. And we lived there till I was about four and you were two. And then we moved to El Reno for a few short mm -hmm. months and he taught veterans there. This was right after the war. Mm -hmm. After World War II. After World War II, he taught veterans there. And then we moved in at the end of 1949, our very first January of 1950, I think right at the tail end of 1949, mm -hmm. into this house. Not this house, but well, the see, one. I had just turned to. The one that John DeRise Hill bit in 1914. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved into that house. Which and they modernized with a bathroom before we moved in. Mm -hmm. And I know you were young, but did you have a sense of what was going on? I mean, was it a shock to you that now I have all this land to run around on? I don't remember that. Well, mine, I was two, so this was, this was my life, all my home. Mm -hmm. I roamed all over this land. I was, I'd love to go outside and, and, and go down the road and pick the wildflowers and ride my bicycle down the road and wander all over the, the land and go down to the trees, what we call the woodland, and uh, play around down there. And it was real peaceful and down there. And there were, in the springtime, there were the sweet blossoming catalpa trees. And I was more the one that loved being outside. Mm -hmm. Carm would sit in the house and read a book. But That's her memories. I loved well, outside. Well, you too. worked. You worked out. You did a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I was a little sister, so she was the one that did that. We work. were playing in the woodland and things like that, mm -hmm. but we could roam this farm. They never worried about us being outside, and which is different than today. But I uh, remember that it was a two-story house and had an upstairs, and it was big mm -hmm. compared to where we lived before. But... Um, I didn't want to sleep upstairs. There was only one bedroom downstairs, but we were both afraid to go upstairs and sleep. And so I would lay on the, I was afraid to get away from my parents, so I would lay on the floor in the kitchen with one of those bulbs, that glaring just bulb down hanging in the kitchen. There wasn't any globe around it. And lay on the floor and go to sleep on the floor. And then I guess that carried me to bed. But we all slept in one big bedroom that first couple of years. And I finally moved upstairs, but we didn't like being upstairs by ourselves. I don't remember being afraid of being upstairs at all. No, because I was there. <laughs> I remember laying upstairs in the cross breeze blowing across the the and, and the sounds outside, the sounds of nature. And I remember hearing Daddy go around the field in the tractor. I remember the Johnny Pop tractor, the neighbor that had the Johnny Pop tractor. You could hear it pop, pop, popping around. So, mm -hmm. I have sweet memories of sleeping upstairs. Oh, I do too. I love the moon. You could see it in the east, you know. Mm -hmm. The window was right by the bed. So and we see. didn't have any real close neighbors. The closest neighbor was a quarter mile away. And they didn't have any children. 
And so we pretty much grew up with each other, except when our cousins came out, or sometimes we had some church friends home on Sunday afternoon. But it was pretty much she and I, and we had a pretty big uh, playground here. And you were the only children uh, of yes. the mm-hmm. so. That's why I sound just like her, because that's, she's the only person I had to talk to. <laughs> but because my father had nine brothers and sisters, they all came back to visit mm-hmm. sometime during the year. They loved to come to the farm. And their memories of their childhood, this is a big, important part of it, is coming to the farm. And I didn't realize. They thought we were rich because we had that big house, but we were very, very poor. And hand-me-down clothes, and, you know. But they loved coming out here, and we enjoyed having them, you know. They got to sleep upstairs. Oh, we loved when the cousins came. That was fun. Do you know what year the the farm got electricity? I I did write that down. Let me. I think it's on the last page here. Nineteen twenty-eight, maybe. Let's see if I got that down. And indoor water. It came with the nineteen fifty moving in. Okay. And I remember the man that helped them build that bathroom and do okay. that. But we continued to carry water from the well to drink. But otherwise, we had faucets that did for all other water uses. Mm-hmm. But that well water was really tasty. Kept it in a bucket and dipped it out with a dipper. How far would you have to walk with the water? From here to the barn, close to the barn, little, just this side of the barn, mm-hmm. not that far. But I remember carrying the buckets, and you do too, don't oh, you? Oh, I carried those buckets. They we can carry two buckets. <laughs> and, if Not you, and then we had to go down after dark and turn the windmill off sometimes. Hmm. And it was quite a ways from the house for a little child. Mm-hmm. And I would think there was a giant coming from that corner up there to get me. Right. You know, oh, back you had lots of fears. <laughs> 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 they thought I was real brave and never scared. I was scared sometimes. Well, tell me about your chores growing up. Well, a lot of our <laughs> chores were had to do with the sheep. Uh-huh. As the cattle, you know, didn't have as much maintenance as the sheep. We were in charge of the sheep as soon as we got old enough. We, uh, my dad may have let them out in the morning of the pen, but if they weren't in the pen at night, the coyotes got them. Mm-hmm. And so it was our job to bring them in. So we got behind them and drove them in the pen, and then I had to count them. She did later, probably. Well, I don't know if you're Well, I did the trying to mess you up on the county. He would, I would be counting, and there were a lot of sheep, and they move around. So, I mean, there were 50 or <laughs> They don't just line sheep. up and let you count them. And she would stand over there and mess my counting, but I don't remember that. But anyway, I was responsible for getting those sheep in, and I do remember early on that one got left out, and I saw what the coyote did to it, mm-hmm. and that pressed me. And uh, there were times that we took the sheep down to greener pastures. And, and the shepherd dry, during the hot, dry summers, we took them all the way down to the woodland, and all, except we couldn't let them go over the fence where the creek kind of left an opening and you could the fence couldn't quite keep them in. Mm-hmm. We had to make sure they, they had to be protected. Mm-hmm. They couldn't just be out there on their own. But they had to be dipped, they had to be sheared. Uh, I guess worm. Tag. They had to be and ear tags. They were registered Shropshire sheep that our daddy um, sold to FFA boys. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So that they sh- they showed the sheep and the bears. And you'd have to shear them and tag them. We and... didn't shear them. We hired a, a crew to come in and shear them. Okay. But well, we now did our help. daddy had shears. He didn't do the most of that. He I probably sheared. He had sheared one, but that whole bunch of sheep. That was a big job. Well, he so. did have sh- more than one pair of electric shears. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't do that part, I know. Well, we, I watched him shear, this crew shear them. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, you, like you said, you had to dip them sometimes. I don't know. We always had to dip they them. They were kind of them. high maintenance sheep work. But yeah. Daddy was real proud of his sheep, and he did have some award-winning sheep prize uh, winning sheep mm-hmm. that went all the way to Kansas City. Mm-hmm. And that picture burned up, but I remember that picture being in our other house. Um, the sheep chores were the main thing in the winter time. We had I had to go throw hay. I don't know if you. I know remember that. pitching hay out of the barn on the after on the school. hay mow down into the mm-hmm. where the For cattle, the cattle. Eat. Mm-hmm. How many head would you have back then? I don't remember. We maybe had 50. more sheep than we had cattle. Probably at the most, maybe fifty head of cattle. No milk cows. Yes, we did have milk cows, and they Who were milked it? until mother started teaching. 
and would you and need all have the milk in it. I did do it, but uh -huh. I never got good at it. Okay. So I no. never got good at it, and it was Jersey cattle, mm. cows, and uh, my daddy used to squirt the milk in my mouth if I happened to be at a farm the right time. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And and it was there was no milking machine. It was all hand milking, and old stalls, you know, that they anchored the the cow's head in. Mm -hmm. I could never get any out either. <laughs> That's a technique. I got a little bit out, but I gave that back over to mother. She could do it faster. I guess if we got hungry enough, we would have figured out. And dad milk out there. Dad milk too. Mm -hmm. Jello was only about four. A large garden. We didn't have a large garden now. When my grandmother was here and my great grandmother was here, mm -hmm. this front yard was all garden, and they raised a lot because mm -hmm. they were self-sustaining. We raised. Dad would till up some land for potatoes and maybe some watermelon. But we didn't squash, grow a little squash. A little squash, but we didn't grow much garden. We went into town to the uh, farmers market in town or produce place in town, and we would buy our produce there. Yeah. So you didn't do a lot of canning. No, actually, our grandmothers did. Mm -hmm. But my dad got a big freezer and put it on that back porch, so we would go in in season and buy the fruit pretty reasonably and slice the peaches or whatever it was and freeze them. That was one of my favorite things was slice peaches. Mm -hmm. For With some cream. reason, gardening was not Daddy's thing, and our mother being employed off the farm would have mm -hmm. was not hers either. Mm -hmm. Although she knew how to can, she mm -hmm. that wasn't mm -hmm. what she did. Well, freezing is a lot easier <laughs> than canning. Now we did uh, churn the milk and make butter, but that wasn't that wasn't our only. And I remember her making cottage cheese and hanging it in cheesecloth. Mm -hmm. that one, I that and one. our chores were hanging clothes. Mm -hmm. And pulling weeds. That was my least favorite. Mm -hmm. Did you, you ever drive the tractor? Or? I did. By the time I was 12, he was teaching me, and you did later. I did a little. Do you but remember he, the first time you drove? I remember he would outline how the tra you know the tractor should follow the next. You just got in the next, mm -hmm. plowed the, along the next line. Just got your wheels right lined up with what was supposed to be next, and I would go around and around. He would pay me. And I saved it. And I don't remember how much I got paid, but I saved it. A lot of it went toward college, I think. I think some of it went toward college and probably got to keep some for buying well, a purse you, or something. You bought a watch and then you jumped in the pool with it. Yeah. <laughs> but our uh, daddy used to go back to uh, OSU and visit the the uh, agriculture department there and talk to people there. And I remember seeing the beautiful farms there with all the perfect rows of beautiful green crops. Mm -hmm. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? And then our mother retained her dentist there from her college years. So she would take us back every year. At least year twice a year. Mm -hmm. And visit her dentist there and um, take us to the university and see that those beautiful old buildings and the, the gorgeous landscaping that was there. And I thought, oh, I wanna go to school there someday. Mm -hmm. That was my dream. Was it yours? Mm -hmm. I guess anyway. I didn't have, it was probably one of my choices, but not where I ended up. Anyway, I, I just thought it was a beautiful campus. And, uh, well, see, speaking of school, where did you go to school when you were growing up? Kingfisher High School. We well, went to school elementary bus. school, Kingfisher Junior High, Kingfisher High School. And how'd you get to school? School bus. School bus. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 our buses were not the long buses like we see mostly now. They were the shorter buses. And uh, sometimes if the roads were muddy, the bigger boys would get in the back and, and go back and forth and try to get the bus stuck. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we had a lot of time riding the school bus and got to know a lot of the students in the school by being on the school bus. With high school, junior high, and elementary school. All in one bus. And it's still that way. Hmm. And were your parents very encouraging? Did they say, think about college? Or, or oh, did you have a choice? From, from birth. From birth. And they started saving for our college from and, as young, far back as we remember. And you don't get married before you finish college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I never had a thought that I wouldn't go to college. No, I think we just knew we would go to college. And we knew how hard they saved for us to go. Mm -hmm. And we actually, even though they had a hard time on the farm when they went to work off the farm, they were able to save for education so we didn't have to work. Mm -hmm. And they were very careful with their money and they invested carefully. And so we really, each of us were able to go to college 
without any without working. Of course, we didn't have a car. That wasn't and, a necessity then. Yeah, but they paid our room and board of books, closed, and we didn't have a whole lot of spending money. You didn't need much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I got a candy bar a day. I didn't. And I I can remember there was a place in Stillwater had fifteen cent grilled cheese sandwiches back in the late sixties. <laughs> Did you both go to Stillwater or I didn't go to Stillwater. I went to Chickasha oh, yeah. Women's College mm -hmm. first because my daddy was working in Chickasha for Soil Conservation Service. Mm -hmm. One summer I went there. Then I went to Oklahoma Christian College, which is now Oklahoma Christian University, for a year in sixty three, sixty four. Then I went to use what used to be called Central State College, is now University of Central Oklahoma, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and graduated from there in 1966. Okay, and then our parents, as soon as we had children and they had grandchildren, they start saving for our children's college education. Well, they started contributing like a hundred dollars at Christmas toward that. They didn't get presents; they got a hundred dollars in the bank for college. <laughs> But they have got highly valued education. <laughs> mm -hmm. And during your breaks from college, would you come back to the farm and work? Not if I, I, could, not if I could help it. Yeah, we didn't come back much. <laughs> but I went through every summer. Uh -huh. I started the year, summer after high school and graduated. I just went every summer to school. I know one year after I got married and wasn't quite out of college, I came back. My husband and I worked a little bit on the farm. Mm -hmm. And my husband at the time and sons, we came back a few times to help with harvest, mm -hmm. which was very memorable times. Did you have any desires to go into farming? Not me. <laughs> I would love to have lived out here back if it looked like it did back then. But after you put up these, uh, this business down the road that has a lot of junky looking uh, machinery parts and, and parts uh, downwind of the dairy that, that brings flies uh, brings odors <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm looking at Amber because she lives in there <laughs> <laughs> she moved in and the wind was not out of the South. dairy direction and she just was fine and then we got a call later that night Help! <laughs> this odor's so, awful. <laughs> but our daddy gave them permission to build the dairy. Or they asked him. But uh, there also is some runoff in the creek. The mm -hmm. little snakes through our property. And uh, sometimes it has pollution from runoff to the dairy. So those things are disappointing. Those things have changed the landscape out here. So I would have liked to have lived out here at one time. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to depend on farming for my income. And I wasn't up for that. And I have a granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter would like to live out here. She's real country minded and likes to hunt and fish and, and ride the tractor and mow and all that. She'd like to live out here someday. I'm guessing he started with 160 acres. Mm -hmm. Did he ever expand around them? He bought the farm the quarter. south, a quarter of land south across this east west road. Okay. In about 1980. Five, I think. And he sold two little acreages within this farm to a couple of different people and six acres to a man on that far corner that way and 12 acres to a man at the far corner this way. And nobody lives in one of them and somebody lives in the other one now. Hmm. That kind of on the edge of the property. Well, any major changes during your, your father's time to the farm? Now remember, he was very frugal, <laughs> and so was our mother. So the home wasn't remodeled much, or furnishings changed much. Uh, the buildings got more and more stuff in them mm -hmm. because he didn't uh, believe, believe in spending money even for his tractor. The last time I remember him driving a tractor, he had tied a chair up on the post where the seat used to be, and he was 95 or older, yeah, 90. About 94, I think, trying to get up and uh -huh. drive that track. And our daddy uh, invested wisely, mm -hmm. and uh, but he didn't spend his money. And he, he got his clothes from the thrift shop, the resale shop in Kingfisher. Mm -hmm. So he, even though he was really generous with us, he was very frugal with himself. And 
still really had the depression mentality as far as, as holding on to everything. Holding on to. And our mother was very frugal and also, and she would save the rubber bands off the newspapers and yep. aluminum foil. And iron the wrapping paper after you use it, you iron it. I guess you'd have to iron the sacks, the gift sacks mm, now. Yeah. Hmm. But she's, she was very, very frugal and very good at making the dollar stretch. And mm -hmm. we never went out to eat, almost virtually never, maybe once a year or such. No, not only Well, not in the early years at all. We didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. Would you go to town at all? We we went to town to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. We went to church every Sunday. You ever go to the picture show or not often. Dad didn't like that, but we did some when we were in high school. And I remember, few times in I grade remember school. the first picture show I saw. Mm -hmm. I did too. A cuts of the Ten us. Commandments or something. No, I remember oh. one. I don't remember the name of it. But our dad really was not into uh recreation <laughs> and so uh, our of course we made a lot of friends in school and and uh, he thought work was fun working on the farm mm -hmm. was fun that was his vacation and he That's wanted what it he to be ours vacation mm -hmm. we had a little different opinion about mm -hmm. that <laughs> um, how would he keep records my mother kept the records but I remember even up until almost he died that whenever he went to the bank and deposited any money, he would call her and tell her what he put in the bank and tell her what he bought. And she just kept records of all of that. And her records were very, very meticulous. Very perfect. And, and in the farm record book, mm -hmm. she might write it on her note first, but then it went to the farm record book so that when taxes, they were very serious about not wanting to over, you know, have to pay all this tax that maybe they wouldn't have to pay if they didn't count all their expenses so they were very careful about keeping those records in those farm record books and I she would be keeping purpose. it today if she was able memory wise she's not able to do that right now but, but i followed like her example it. and one thing they did for us that really helped me is from the time they were about my age or younger maybe 60 they started showing me their file cabinet with, and he saved everything the file cabinet with all the records for every year that went back, back, back. Mm -hmm. And he took me to town, introduced me to the banker, the telephone office people, the uh, everywhere there was that he did any business, he would introduce me to people. And uh, so when he died, I knew these people. I knew where his bank accounts were. I knew where his, you know, how to take care of the telephone bill and how to take care of this or that that had to do with this farm and I was able to keep the record book because my mother had gone over that with me and I could just start up where she left off and couldn't do it. He was living on his own when he was 95 and mm -hmm. passed away mm -hmm. and he was he would go to town and get his we didn't really want him to drive but uh, we we tried to put it into that but it didn't happen but he would go to town and buy his newspaper and pay his bills because he liked to socialize with people in town. And sometimes they came out and helped him out of his car. Hmm. And so. he went to all the meetings, the Wheat Growers Association, the Pioneer Telephone Meeting, just every one of them. You know, he, wow. he went to all, anything that he was associated with, he went to the meetings. And I didn't tell you, but in 1942, I think, the house was hit by a tornado, the big the 1914 built Montgomery Ward house. And my uncles and aunts were there, and it was in the middle of the night. There was no warning. And it blew out all the windows but one north window. And it blew the double doors that were between the dining room and living room down. But it didn't hurt anyone. Wow. Uh, it may have done a little damage to outside buildings, I don't know. And then in 2004, that house burned down, and there was a big grass fire. We think it might have started, it was real high winds, like mile 70 and 80 mile gust, and it may have clapped some old electrical lines together. So there wasn't anyone smoking on the property. Mm -hmm. And there might have been a storm 18 miles away with a little lightning. But anyway, a big grass fire started when it finally caught the propane tank on fire. Then the house was a goner, and it was too hard to put out. So it burned to the ground along with the buggy garage and the hen house. And then that night, after they thought they had it all out, they left. 
it, the embers from it burned the old house born in, built in 1892 in that brooding house. And uh, the only thing it didn't burn was the barn, which had a metal roof. And this case band building out here, it didn't burn those two. And the case band building was built later, like in the 70s or 80s. Mm. On a pickup with the fire, um, it probably was just a big uh, uh, tragedy. tragedy for your family. Um, what happened? Tell me about the cleanup afterwards. <laughs> That's an interesting story because our daddy really could not bear to bury the rebel. So it stayed there with orange bird, whatever they call it, that they, for safety, they run, they fence off that area. Uh -huh. He could not bear to, to do fill it. in the basement hole where everything landed. Everything burned down. Just sunk into the basement. Wow. So it was until he was. After uh, he passed away. Yeah. That we could actually clean up very. Four rubber. years later. Four years later. Heartbreaking for him. And even though it was an old house with old furniture and uh, nothing that that the world would value in there, it was his home, and he was he was really devastated. And he he really didn't know what to do. And Carm mainly finally got him mm -hmm. interested and in, twisted his arm and talking and talking to. To Putting getting this, home, uh, this home here, which is a double wide solitaire home, mm -hmm. and uh, he was going to just go spend five thousand dollars for an old rickety trailer that the floor was caving in because he didn't want to spend money. But we took him to the city, and it's the first time I ever remember him writing a big check and making a decision in one day to buy this house. He wanted to live here on this farm so bad. He was at the point of wanting to, you know, camp out in the barn, mm -hmm. and uh, so he. He, he really, he never really got over that. Although he, he made the best and our daddy, you know, had the respect for the people in the town. He was friendly and the people in the town were friendly. And the, he got a lot of support, but he grieved. I think he never got over grieving, losing the, the home. Did anything special burn up in the house? Uh, there was a chair upstairs in a room that we just stored things in. And it was Governor Say's, Territorial Governor Say's chair. And he had lived here in Kingshire uh, for a short time. The They still have the Say mansion there. Mm -hmm. And so we were going to give this chair. My dad didn't want to give it away. He thought it was worth too much money. Mm -hmm. But at some point when he wasn't here, we were going to give it to the museum. the museum or to the Say mansion so they would have an original piece of furniture. I don't think they had any original. But we have a picture of that. and. Uh, he valued that, and we valued that. Mm -hmm. Leather, big leather upholstery, kind of looked like an office chair. It may have been his office chair. Wow. Family photos, pictures, records. Actually, there were a few that burned up, mm -hmm. but I had been here, and I was afraid of a fire sometime getting the house because there was so much paper in it. Mm -hmm. And the electrical system was very old in the house. And so I had asked him for pictures, and I would take them home with me and make a copy put the copy back in the frame and keep the original. So I ended up with most of the important family pictures that dated back clear to John DeBrice Hill's family. Did he know you were making copies? Mm -hmm. Oh, I and think he putting the copies well, back. Well, <laughs> I don't think he even cared. They looked good to him. Right. But I felt good about it. He did too after he burned the house burned down. I good. still had all his pictures. There wasn't anything of monetary value in that house. Mm -hmm. The value was the furniture sentimental was old, value. Old furniture, a lot of junk. We had wondered what we would do with that house. Mm -hmm. no, we don't we hated that. to burn it down because it was so old and had history, but we really couldn't have uh, maintained it or, or remodeled it enough mm -hmm. to par with electricity, you know, inspect, you know, up the code. Mm -hmm. It would have cost so much to do it. We didn't have any money to live here bad enough to do that. So. Wow. But how much longer did he live after the fire? Four more years? Uh, from 2004 to two th April 2007, so that's three more, three years. more years. And part of that time he was in a nursing home mm -hmm. because he fell. And, and we thought he would never come back to the farm. And but he said a day. He was determined. He wanted to be back home for harvest. Yeah. He went into the hospital in October, November. He went into a assisted living center in probably December, late that, that year. Mm -hmm. 
of uh, 04. And then in 05, he was in the assisted living center. And he kept telling me he was going to go home. And they said, well, if you'll get out of that wheelchair and start walking, you can go home. So he gradually got to where he could get up and pull over the walls and walk. And by May, early May, he went home. And he was here for homeless. And we thought he would get out and he would fall. And, and that'd be the end of him. But he didn't. If he fell, he got up. <laughs> he did fall that one time again, but... But he managed to keep going. Mm -hmm. And he really didn't want any help here. He wanted to do it himself, and mm -hmm. so he did. Well, I think it's that love for the land. Mm -hmm. Love of the land and pioneer spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, talk to me a little bit about the fences on the property. Well, originally there were Bodark posts used for fences and probably some post up, but mostly Bodark because that's what trees we see out here right now. Mm -hmm. And they are very sturdy posts. I mean, they don't rot easily. Crooked and ugly. And, and if you get around a <laughs> Bodark tree, you get scratched, but they cut those posts up and made fences. And they were the same fences that were still here when he died. Wow. Even though the, there weren't very many strands of wire left and they might have been leaning, fin not very good fences at that time. But there were barbed wire fences, and they were built or put in back in John DeBrice Hill's time. Mm -hmm. And they built those trees, or they planted those trees so that they would they would have those for fence posts. And two, it, bogart trees make kind of a thick underbrush around them, and the animals can't even get through them easy. They kind of make, that's what the border was out here along this road. The border along so it kind of made its own fence, too, yeah. even though there was a fence. Yeah, the barbed bar wire could be nailed to the tree. So in 2007, we, or eight, we started working toward getting new fences so it would be, um, help the liability situation, keep people out, keep what need to be in. Mm -hmm. in. And barbed wire fences are now here all around the exterior, but there's not very many interior fences because mm -hmm. there's no livestock. Right. Mm -hmm. And as you'll see on other farms in this area and on other parts of the country, they built a, uh, a snow and wind belt of trees, cedar trees. In the 19, late 1940s and 50s, early 50s. And those trees have now kind of gone to the wayside, but there are other trees that have taken their place in there. So they're still kind of a wind belt. Like a shelter oh, belt. Shelter belt is what it's called. And this, this is not really what you would call a wooded area. <laughs> and when we came here one time, my sons grew up in, in big cities. We lived in the Dallas suburb. And my son got out of the car when he was four and he said, Mom, the sky sure is big here. <laughs> and so that tells you a lot about the landscape around here. Well, what about the, the water source? Well, the well where the windmill still stands, although the one of the storms blew the uh, top of that windmill, what do you call it? The blades? What's the top of the pan called? The veins. The veins and the blades of it off. We still have those, but you can see where it was. That well was dug in 1892. It's not very deep, maybe 20 foot deep. And uh, it was used then for the house that was built in 1892 and the livestock tank was real close. And then at some point, there was a concrete storage tank built and water could flow into that and be stored there and then piped to the house. And that was our source of water. That was our source of water, but some years and sometimes there was a lot of drought, dry mm -hmm. times. And we used about six inches of water in our bathtub to take a bath. You didn't ever fill it up. Unless you were afraid pipes might freeze. And they did a lot in the winter. Uh -huh. The pipes weren't very far into the ground pump was would freeze up sometimes and uh, so we just were very conservative of water and if we knew it was winter and might freeze or there might be a leak we would fill a big tub with water and some pails and jars and that's what we use you know and in recent years this last mm -hmm. about a year ago we had such a severe drought mm -hmm. that the well really wasn't pumping hardly any water so we just this year 1911 actually the end of 1911, had someone drill a new well. And so we have a new well and, and more water supply now. It's deeper, like 120 or more feet deep. And yeah. back then, we just took one bath a week, way back from the little. <laughs> well, I did. 
And Mama <laughs> made me on Saturday. <laughs> Would you have ponds on the property? There is. There was at one time real close to the house here within oh, 400 yards or something of the house. There was a pond that the livestock drank out of. Mm -hmm. It now has filled in some, but there's another pond at the other far corner of the property down by a pasture that cattle could use. And that was dug out probably in the 1970s or something. And it was a pretty nice pond. This last summer with the drought, it did dry up too. Not a place to go fishing or swimming. Mm -hmm. Ready, red, muddy, muddy water. <laughs> well, at that time, you missed out on the, the wash tubs, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at least we had a bath tub. <laughs> <laughs> there was an outdoor toilet here, which stood here until the house burned. It leaned toward the later years, but there was always an outdoor toilet behind the buggy yard. Uh, one hole or two hole? One. Two. Was it one? Oh, I think it was one. I don't remember. I, I, Daddy would go in there sometimes and use it in later years, so I was afraid that's the way he would go. <laughs> the thing would fall over and <laughs> he'd go with it. <laughs> what a way to go. So, tell me a little bit about decision making in the family. Well, the men in the family, clear back to great grandfather Hill, made all the decisions. And I was told, I never knew him or his wife, but I was told by his children, his grandchildren probably, that Mary Shaw Hill, his wife, never had no say in the house as far as when it was built, how it was built. And uh, I think a very quiet woman, but he, he made the decisions. And then my grandfather, Herbert C. Hill, definitely made the decisions about what they spent money on or what they did. And my father pretty much did that too. Although they were bet, both educated and my mother helped a lot and mm -hmm. kept the books and typed the reports and did a lot of the, that type of work. Uh, whether we bought new furniture, whether we bought a car, what we did that day, it was his decision. Pretty what, well centered around him. What did your mom think about that? She bothered her, but she didn't, you know, back in those days, you didn't bucket. I mean, she mm -hmm. didn't bucket at all. She just went along and did what she Best you could. Did did they take a page out of the depression? Did they ever buy anything on credit or did no, they always they ever buy? Not. Well, yes, the they farm. did. The farm. <laughs> they had to borrow money to buy the farm. They probably had part of it and had to borrow the rest. But and paid was. it off during those dry drought years because mm -hmm. <laughs> it was bought in 1941 or two. I bought a car. Uh, financed a car after I was after I graduated from college and had a job, and my dad paid it off, mm -hmm. and I didn't want him to pay. He didn't it want off. us. He couldn't debt stand for a home thought of the home. debt, hmm. so he didn't. That's the only thing I know he went off in debt for. Did he trust banks? I know you mentioned he did trust he banks. Okay, he did trust banks. There was one son of the original land burn guy, John DeRice Hill, that lost all his oil money in near Moore mm -hmm. and Norwell, and it had to do with when he went to put in the bank, or had to do with the bank. Lost all his money, but that's the only story we knew of. Knew about that. Otherwise, there was an old safe here, and my, we found it after the fire. Mm -hmm. Found it after the fire, and it had some of the records. That's how I knew what he paid for the farm, and some of the early tax records were in there. And they hadn't burned, there were two doors into that safe. The safe was about a yard wide, uh -huh. and maybe 18, inch square and it had an exterior of steel and then an interior compartment that's where those records were that survived the fire a little bit brown mm -hmm. but the building that safe was in burned and we just had some guys come out and pick up scrap iron recently and haul that off maybe a month ago so you could have had a picture of it mm -hmm. would you uh would you notice county agents or home demonstration mm -hmm. agents coming by they did come out a lot because we had this registered Shropshire sheep and the 4-H boys bought registered Shropshire sheep, the FFA boys bought them, and my dad was friends with the home extension. He was interested in working with them. Mm -hmm. They worked with him and he worked with them and he did a lot of the soil conservation things that they promoted. So there was uh, a lot of communication and education that went on the back and forth. I know your mom worked off the, the farm, but did she belong to a home demonstration club? She did. She did. I don't remember the name of it. And my grandmother did too. Hmm. And, and they, would go, they would meet at somebody's house once a month and mm -hmm. somebody would demonstrate like how to upholstery a chair or maybe cook some special 
or guarding. Or had to right. guard yeah. mm -hmm. And were y'all involved with 4-H? Uh, we were both in 4-H club. I was in 4-H club for at least two years and showed a sheep and did home demonstrations and timely topics. And we showed our sheep. That's what we showed. Local and we had our little sewing project. My first one was the scarf that you fringed the edges, and I still have that. And then the next one was a handkerchief that you hemmed the edges. I know from there I just. I had a pin cushion. I still have the apron I made, full length apron, and little other aprons that I made in 4 H Club. And then a dress, you know, later. But um, showed, had those in. Uh, the state fair contest or local fair contest, but we went to the local fairs a lot and to the state fair because my dad was an agricultural agriculture teacher and they were showing sheep and things there that he had raised here on the farm. So we went and followed him around, got real tired. You know. We didn't see the uh, we didn't get to go on Midway, <laughs> but we we did go to the fair. Mm -hmm. Then one time we went through the Midway and you got lost. I did get lost and I was. I, on the state fair. Because I wouldn't hold your hand. Mm -hmm. And they took somebody, some man came along and offered to take me to the police station. And I went with him. And I waited there at the police station until they came and get, got me. On the fairgrounds. I thought that was a very, very, very big fair and a very scary place. She was me. only like five or six at the most. And I know the police station, they offered me a hamburger and I really wanted it, but I was afraid to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you mentioned a little bit about Christmas and the gifts you got growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, did you celebrate any other holidays, Easter? Thanksgiving was a big one because we usually had a Hill family here at Thanksgiving. So that would be a lot of people and a lot of cousins and a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And our mother was the most gracious hostess. And she always, we have a picture of her circling the table seeing if anyone wanted to With an apron on breezing by. You know, it wasn't like you all went through and helped yourself. You. You may have done that too, but you passed the food and you made sure everybody had what they needed. And there were lots of cousins and they got to eat on the back porch or wherever they could find a seat. So lots of cooking going on. Lots of cooking and lots of dishes brought from other ladies that brought their food. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, it was good. Christmas wasn't as big a holiday. Our dad wasn't as much into celebrating Christmas. We, we did a little bit of that. Fourth of July? No, we weren't allowed to go so. to town and watch that, but we, we were outside. The old house had a flat roof over the front porch, and we could go sit up there and see the fireworks from here mm -hmm. and that were in Kingfisher. And we also sometimes, he would go up there and lay down and we'd look at the stars. And I, that was a good memory, too. Would you go to church at all? Oh, every Sunday. We there. went to the Kingfisher Church of Christ. It was a little building, uh, uh, you know, small congregation. Yeah. And we'd have little friends there, and sometimes they'd come home with us on a Sunday. And sometimes we'd have the preacher out and uh, have fried um, chicken. Mm -hmm. always that fried was chicken. always fried chicken. And it was fried before you and went to church. And the trimmings, yeah. Fried before you went to church. There wasn't any of this coming home and then making dinner. We had to make the gravy later, later probably, after we got home. But um, my dad may have missed the church service uh, two or three times when it was har there was harvesters out harvesting. But we always went, mm -hmm. even though he might have been with the harvesting crew. And one of the things back then that people did was they had a container that held drippings from like the bacon. And that's what they seasoned the vegetables with. Mm -hmm. Fried your potatoes, fried your okra in that deep bacon grease. And the best meal was the fried chicken with the drippings from the pan making gravy. And I learned to stir the gravy. Mother would say, you stir the gravy and she would I would just start out with what she put in the flour and the grease, and then she'd add a little milk, and I'd stir it, and she'd put it in the stir. So that's a pretty good gravy maker. Did you, did you have a favorite meal she would fix? That was it. That was it? For me, fried chicken and gravy, and I loved her gravy on bread, or her gravy on bread. I was, uh, there was only one year when I was in school before my mother took a teaching job. So I remember getting off the bus, and she, at the school bus, after school, when I was in the first grade, and she had black eyed peas and cornbread ready for us. And uh, then after that year, she went to work. So those days were over for coming into a hot meal. We ate mostly a lot of vegetables, a lot of black eyed peas and cornbread. And a lot of fried potatoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not a whole lot of beef, even though we had cattle. Never remember eating sheep. 
right. and they were show sheep, they were registered sheep straw. You could get more money out of another way and that just wasn't on. Hmm. And not much pork, my dad didn't believe in eating much pork. Our daddy was uh, very nutrition conscious. Actually, our mother was also, so I don't know where the bacon grease came in because she didn't do that in later years at all. Mm -hmm. She would season her food with olive oil, but uh, he loved to walk over the land and pull up these plants and the, he would tell the nutritional properties of them. He'd say, this is good for, dandelions are good for this. And, and he, in later years, and you know, he tried to teach us things about that and we just snickered at him, but and didn't pay any attention. He sprayed our dandelions. <laughs> Told but, him, don't eat our dandelions, they've been sprayed. <laughs> but since then, I've gone to the nutrition store and I bought the same uh, nutritional supplements that he ate out of the ground. And then he, he liked to go to the dairies in, in later years when his health was failing and he would go to the dairy, find a dairy that would sell him a colostrum from the, the mother cow. So, and he would drink that. And he, he lived a lot longer than the doctors predicted he would. Actually, it, the reason he got the colostrum was he had, he wouldn't go to the dentist. He would never go to the dentist. Mm -hmm. He would, well, he might go, but he wouldn't let him pull a tooth or do anything. Mm -hmm. And so he would get an impact, you know, infection, and his his jaw would swell up. So m the dairy on the first corner wouldn't give him any milk because fear of, of making him sick and he'd sue him liability. But he found it. He drove around until he found a man that would give him some of the first milk that the cow produces for the calf and the colostrum, and he would put that in his cheek and hold it in there, and that swelling would go down, the infection would go away. No kidding. But mm -hmm. the colostrum has properties not just for teeth, but for any. That has an extreme nutritional value. I, I purchased it before. I have some. And if you're sick or something. Immunities. It's about immunities because it's the first milk that comes down mm -hmm. from the mother mm -hmm. cow. So it's, it helps her babies be immunized against. So it's, mm -hmm. it's an immunizer. And he would walk through the wheat field and break off the head of the wheat, rub it till it was just grain, and then he'd put it in his mouth and chew it up, chew it, and make a gum out of it. And then to the day he died, there was a jar of wheat in the refrigerator, and he would boil it and just eat it like cereal. And he could tell the stage of the wheat and the readiness by chewing it also, the readiness for harvest. And the man that farms this now was, my dad was his mentor, and he learned, he just tells us now he learned everything about farming, even though he grew up on a farm. He said, I learned everything I know from your dad. Hmm. And my dad would walk out in the field and say, you know, it's at this stage or that stage or you know, of the wheat. Mm -hmm. and uh, and participated with this man that was learning from him and then later that man rented the land and that's what he does now but you know, he sure taught him a lot and when he died my dad died the man at the funeral home that was sitting for people to come and view the older man there I think he just worked there part time I think he even been a sheriff he said when they put your dad in the ground they're burying a lot of knowledge so he learned a lot. He just always learned and liked to learn more. Any other home remedies he would employ? Uh, I know my grandmother did the baking soda and water for kids after they'd been out and got poison ivy or whatever they had got from being outside. She would use baking soda. Now he did, this one's kind of extreme, but when, when mold grew on something, he said that was penicillin. And our daddy could eat food that no one else could digest. And and it did not make him sick. Yeah. <laughs> How often, if he got hurt or sick, would you see a doctor or? He would go in, he, he liked to go to the hospital, very liked to go to the doctor. And used to, you now have to have a doctor put you in the hospital for your insurance to pay. But he didn't have, Medicare Part B, so he would show up at the emergency room door <laughs> more than he'd go to the doctor, but he didn't have anything against going to the doctor. But the last time he left this house, his last this stay in this house, and the last time he left this house, he really needed to be in the hospital, but he really didn't want to go. And I was talking, and the neighbor was talking to him, and Finally, he agreed to ride in the ambulance, but he said, I don't want to ride in the back. So he rode in the front of the ambulance <laughs> to the hospital, and he never made it back here. 
Oh, uh, man. Yeah. But his goal was always to make it right here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, tell me about uh, the, the challenges of agriculture through the years. I mean, did you notice anything especially in the 70s, 80s? Uh, I don't remember a lot in the 70s and 80s being bad. I wasn't living here, but back in the 50s, it was very hot. I remember the temperatures getting up to 113. Mm-hmm. We had no uh, air conditioning, and I remember laying on the floor with a fan blowing on us or being, you know, from in the coolest part of the house we could find because it was just too hot to do anything else. And I remember the drought years, most recent drought years, and hailstorms, most recent hail. And then April 22nd, about two years ago, three years ago in the spring, we had a freeze. Mm -hmm. I think that was spring before last. And that, my dad had never seen a freeze on April 22nd, I don't think, and it ruined the wheat. So we've had three crop failures for wheat for three years in a row. We've collected, he's collected crop insurance. Mm It was always a risky business. Yeah, it still is. Recently, I mean, last year the drought was pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Did y'all feel the effects of that? Oh yes. In fact, this house, the walls kind of cracked. You know, it was locked up and empty, and and the wheat so crop hot. was poor. Mm-hmm. Very poor. A poor crop. yield. And the well went dry, mm-hmm. or pretty dry. So it wasn't wasn't a good place to live then during the drought. Well, tell me what's going on today on the farm. Well, we have leased the farm to uh, a man that, that, like my, I said a while ago, my dad mentored him. He was just a friend to him, and yeah. they were a lot alike as far as their farming and uh, neighbors. being conservationist and conserving the money and neighbors and went to the same church. So he rents this land and uh, does a good job with it. Uh, my daughter lives here and has a family of six, and and is beginning to really like living out. She's never lived on a farm, but she's loving the farm now and enjoying the scenery and the wheat fields and the green of that now changing to gold and, you know, uh, quietness of it, privacy of it. She's enjoying that. And I have another granddaughter that would like to live out here someday. So there's hope that there will be still family members here after us. We'd like to think there would be. My dad always wanted there to be Someone actually, when this became a Centennial Farm, he wanted us to continue working it mm-hmm. after he couldn't anymore. And we lived in the city and had our own jobs and families there, so we didn't. But uh, now there's someone living here in the family. And, and our children will inherit this. And we'd love to think about it staying in the family, but we won't have any control over that at that time. Mm-hmm. So we, maybe some of them will maintain and mm-hmm. this land and keep it in the family mm-hmm. so looking towards the next hundred years you hope it stays in the family yes I would really be like nice. for it too one son thinks it should be a hunting farm <laughs> I kind of don't like that because it's a it's a farm for raising crops and cattle and feeding the nation it's not really for pleasure but I mean it's okay to hunt on it you can hunt on it too you can do both does the farm hold sentimental value for y'all? Yes. Definitely. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I am feel an attachment um, to this land. I know my sons have that same feeling of, of family and land and connection. Connection, importance of it. Probably the history of it means more to Carm and I mm-hmm. than it does to our sons, but it probably will mean more to them in the future. And I think it would be nice to save this history so that the ones that aren't born yet can go back and find out about their great grandfather and pioneers. We're excited about being a part of your project so that we can maintain the history. Well, as we, we kind of move to the tail end of our interview today, any stories that we may have missed? You mentioned something about the bucket? Oh, we'd go out when the time to get the cattle in, we'd go shake the bucket and swoo-ee the cattle and they'd come running to come in. And then uh, another way to notify folks, you would, uh, how when would you say for five... dinner, when food was prepared for dinner, the noon meal, we'd go out and wave a white rag or sheet or something in the air so they'd come and get it. 
and they'd wash up outside at the cistern. That was another water source I didn't mention on the back porch is a cistern collected rainwater and you could pump it in, in a little bowl and they could wash up there before they came in to eat. And I guess you could get a drink of water, but I don't think we did. Our drinking water was carried in buckets because that was fresh and safer. Well, one thing that I wanted to talk about was when we grew up here in the country, then you always waved at the neighbors as they came by and there weren't that many. And uh, then in, you went to this small community in Kingfisher and you knew the merchants and you knew the people on the street and it was a good feeling. And it's still a good feeling when we go into Kingfisher because uh, there's a lot of virtu uh, old fashioned virtues and values that are still in place in this community. So we just have a pleasant experience when we come back to visit. I guess your neighbors have changed over time. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Mason Dairy Farm took the place of the older people that moved here in the early 1900s that we remember as children. Mm -hmm. Well, the generation of our parents, the age of, you know, that were even, many of them were younger than our parents, but they're deceased. They're all deceased now. Mm -hmm. Our mother is the only one that's still mm -hmm. living of the, na the original neighbors here back when we were growing up. Any lessons? that your father or mother passed down to you that just really stick out in your mm -hmm. mind? How uh, don't kill the, go the goose that lays the golden egg. You know, that was one mother said a lot. And, you know, save your money, don't squander it so you'll have it when you need to, in your old age or for your health or for what's important, not just, you know, a toy. Wouldn't hardly give the grandkids toys or we didn't give any toys. So they saved. That's what I remember. And the value of education, very, very important. And, and the our, nutritional lessons that we learned. Yes, yes. That we're just now implementing in our own lives. <laughs> and my dad would like to say in the garden was real important. He wanted, you know, that the children learn how to do a garden and eating fresh foods versus going to the store and buying the junk. And when our economy has taken a downturn in the last few years, we've considered, you know, we have this farm. If we ever needed to come back here, we could, we could have a lot of one-acre plots out here. <laughs> we could have the mechanic, the doctor, the nurse, the, all the people we needed. And I guess my dad was the first one to go to A&M College in Stillwater, and he encouraged his sisters and brothers who then their children, some of them went there, and it's down to about the fifth generation now, so uh, lots of lots of multiplied out. That's a you know. good family tradition. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'll say so. Um, where is your father buried? He's at Kim Kingfisher Cemetery. And there are quite a few Hill family members there. He really wanted to be buried on the farm, kind of, but well, he had... He, he bought had, the plot yeah, in town. He knew he was going to be buried in there. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add that we didn't speak about today? Hmm, I can't think of much. Um, I think we covered most of it. You know, my dad wanted to keep the farm in the family, so we don't want to sell it. If we have to have money, we won't sell the farm first. That won't be the first thing to go. But just a lot of things that, values that they had back then and reusing everything and not throwing anything away. Although, you have to throw some things away that he didn't. But uh, that value, you know, of just not wasting anything. Mm -hmm. For us, this was home, but to our children, it was a novelty. This mm -hmm. farm because it was so different from the cities that mm -hmm. they grew up in. But I still like to live on the edge of town or out where I can see the skyline and the. Oh, work, seeing the know. sky is very important to me. The, the years the that I lived in homes where I couldn't see anything but the next rooftop, I didn't like that. I like to see the clouds rolling in and the wind, feel the wind blowing, and the things that you have here that you don't have in town. Do you still have a city? Family gatherings here at the farm? Uh, we really haven't because this house hasn't been occupied since my dad died and really he was living here alone and it wasn't very presentable for company. But future wise we may. When we have family planted, reunions, they come out and we visit. We planted three trees right in front of this house on the west to shelter it from the west sun and as a place to be in memory of my dad and his dad and his dad and the families that went before us so that someday we like have a picnic out there under those trees and this is where the old house was. That's where they're planted, but, right where the old house was. The, the family 
extended family does like to come, the brothers and sisters and grandchildren, our cousins, they do love to come out here and visit. Herbert C. Hill's family. They, and but we Hill. don't actually feed people here usually. They have the reunion in Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. and they some of we invite all of them to come out if they want to. And I think last year not many came, but they usually, some of them do come out here because they remember it's fond memories. Well, I could tell how much this farm means to you and your family, and I thank you so much for, for sharing it with us today. Okay, well, thank, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to do this. Mm -hmm. Thank you.